um, how is isolation going? Yeah, it's okay. It's taken a lot longer than I thought to get used to it. I think I assumed it, it wouldn't feel that different, but I think it's that sense now of being like, oh God, this is for a long time. Mm. And trying to gain any sort of sense of routine and normality within it. Are you in London or in Cornwall or where? No, I'm um, at my parents' house in Wiltshire, um, which is an amazing place to be. I feel very lucky to be here and go for a nice long walk every evening, dance mm. in the fields a bit, feel a bit better through doing that. Nice. Well, Lamorna, before you get going, I just wanted to introduce you because obviously we know you really well. We gave a little introduction at the beginning, but I think some people join late. So for those who don't know who you are, we have known Lamorna a long, long time. And she's done a lot, a uh, lot more in her life than be a mentor for Opperdon. But one of the things she's done is worked with a lot of the kids uh, who we support at Opperdon. And she's worked on our summer camps. And I remember speaking to her when she was a 22 year old who said, I'd like to write a book. And I thought, oh, that's kind of brave. And now I've read about her in the Financial Times. I've listened to her book, her book serialized on BBC Radio 4's Book of the Week. I've even seen her mentioned in Vogue this weekend. I don't know if you even knew about that, Lavola, but yeah. I did, I got told yesterday. <laughs> which is amazing. So we're very proud to have you talking with us. And I know that of the kids who are listening, we have a great many who would really, really like to follow the same track as you. And they're interested in English, or maybe they're not yet interested in English, but they know that they'd quite like to explore writing. And I think what's interesting is about having you with us today specifically is that you really are a writer at the beginning of that journey. You know, you're in the Amazon bestseller book uh, list, so maybe for not fish, that not yeah. properly, just for fishing and agriculture. So I'm against agriculture. the book about we'll aquariums. Take we'll take it. But it's really exciting. But I think it's a more approachable story for us to discuss because you're still hitting so many things you want to achieve rather than speaking to Margaret Atwood or whatever. In a few <laughs> but maybe we'll try and get her next week. Yeah, she'd be great, I reckon. Be great. <laughs> so I thought maybe you could like introduce a little bit about yourself, a little bit specifically about like your childhood and how that got you into what you're doing now. And then Walter and I will try and ask a couple of questions. And I'd love anyone out there who has a, a, a question they'd really like ask, asked, asked or answered, please do pipe up on the Q&A. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I don't think I always wanted to be a writer, but certainly I've always used writing as a way of trying to understand experiences. So since I was little, that was trying constantly to keep diaries and doing it very badly and starting again in a different notebook every couple of months. And then as I got older, I got quite obsessed about dialogue and I started writing down little bits of dialogue. And then I started writing plays when I was around 16. And these were so pretentious, but a way of trying to explore different kinds of thinking. And I was constantly, I think I was learning so much. I think the, one of the best things about being in your teenage years, and I often get this with some of the students that I mentor for, is they are just alive with ideas. Everything is new and so exciting. And I think I wanted to explore everything and write all these characters and try and understand the world that way. So I think from a young age, it's kind of always been that the way I filter experience is through writing it down and hoping it makes better sense after doing that. that wow. makes a lot of sense. And so was there a moment where you thought actually becoming a writer was something you could do and, and be paid to do it and like make it a career or has that been a really re recent realization? That was recent. I think when I was at university, I decided I wanted to write plays. And um, at the university I was at, there's this, um, the first term, you can enter this competition for freshers where you all have to write a play or you have to just put on any play and perform it and you're against those of other different groups of freshers and I decided um, we did, were going to do a play that someone else had written, that a professional playwright had written and then I was like oh why don't why don't I just write it should we just let's just make a play so within my first couple of weeks in between kind of various freshers events and trying to write essays we wrote I wrote this play and then my three or four new friends I'd met directed it and we put it on and I remember being the most exciting experience that you could write something and then it'd be put on and then I think that's when I was like, oh my gosh, cool. I think I can do this. I'd love to do this. Um, and then I, after university, I worked at the Times Literary Supplement, which is a kind of like magazine, well, it's not magazine. It's like a newspaper supplement sort of that does beautiful long form reviews. And at the same time, I was doing a master's in anthropology and I went and stayed in this fishing town and I was writing, I was researching what this fishing town was like, um, all the fishermen who lived there, what it was like to be a fisherman. And then I wrote an article about that. And then a publisher, this is like the most lucky thing that's ever happened. A publisher happened to read it, invited me in and said, would you like to write a book about this? And I was like, oh my God, how do you write a book? 
what, what does that even mean? I Googled how you write a book. I Googled how long chapters are. There was no conclusive answers. And so I think, I don't think I'd have had the confidence just to do it. So I was really lucky to have this publisher who was like, I think you can do this. You're going to give it a go. Let's try this out. Nice. I mean, the question I had was that um, wanting to write a book is a, is a romantic thing that we all would love to do. I personally would love to do it, although would be awful at it. Is it as simple as just opening up a Word document and getting going? Or do you need a formative experience like you had to, um, to, 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 to get started? I think, I always think about this. I think everything can be a spark for something. So often I'll have a conversation with someone and something that they'll say, like I was talking, I was Skyping a friend in Russia yesterday and she said, told me this one story about something that happened to her. And immediately I was like, oh God, that would be the most amazing kernel for a book or a short story. Um, so I think it's not that you have to go looking for experiences. It's just listening to your own experiences quite carefully and kind of wanting to follow those through. So something happens to you rather than just going, oh, okay, it's like sitting with that and being like, how can I develop this or expand it? So in your book, it's called Dark Salt Clear, Life in a Cornish Fishing Town. Um, you spend uh, some months on a fish fishing trawler living with Cornish fishermen and fisherwomen. Can you explain your experiences there or, or any fun things you got up to there? Um, so that I think the most exciting thing I did, and I think this remains the most exciting thing I've done. I'm hoping to have an experience soon that beats yeah. it in terms of it being quite as strange and un unusual, maybe. But I went on a trawler for a week with a fisherman called Don. It was his birthday yesterday. He's 55. And his three other fishermen who work for him to the crew of the boat. And so I spent eight days at sea learning to gut fish, um, every kind of fishing. Think of ray, lemon sole, megram sole, all that kind of thing and then living in a cabin with these four guys. And I think that was one of the richest experiences I've had. And I couldn't stop writing. And I've got this like really sort of seasick um, notebook with my handwriting, it's like duh, 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 all over the place. Yeah. And then mainly it's like pictures of different fish and me trying to write down how to gut them. So I could remember the next day for when the fisherman asked me to gut that fish again. So I think that was a really strange experience and cooking on board this boat that's kind of rocking all over the place. Um, and I think it almost, it felt like a home by the end of the seven days because there was no Wi-Fi, no internet. It was just the four of us or the five of us sitting there every night watching the sea. That's cool. Can I ask what the, uh, what the dynamic was like between you and these guys? I read, I read in one of the articles in the FT that they called you Ray Mundo. Is that something to do with a Ray? Yeah, that was, I was, I think they only called me that really offhandedly. So most fishermen have really good nicknames. So quite a lot of the guys out there, so there was Crab Daddy, um, Nocta, uh, let me think of all the good names. Oh, Cod, loads of different other ones. Like everyone gains a fishing nickname. Say again. I said simple but effective, Cod. Yeah, simple but effective, all yeah. fishing related. And I think I was desperate to get myself a fishing nickname. And finally, I got really into, and with a kind of like morbid and sort of like slight horror at myself for doing this, of this, of basically killing fish. I'd never killed an animal before. Um, and I felt whilst I was on the boat that I wanted to work on the boat or I felt completely redundant otherwise. But at the same time, it wasn't natural to be killing living things. But for some reason, I got quite into the way that you kill these gut, uh, you kill these rays, which is quite dramatic and violent. Um, and the fishermen thought this was quite funny. And they were like, oh, you're Raymundo. And I think they only said it once. And I was like, yes, Raymundo. <laughs> From then on, took it as my nickname. And so um, you've written this book to to much acclaim, which is brilliant. And um, it's been published and it's out and the reviews are good. And you've, you know, we've talked a little bit about suddenly having more kind of appreciation with those who give reviews and so on. And I guess like um, you would say that's a success, but the way we define success is continuously reevaluated as you achieve something. You've produced this great book. Is there a feeling of looking forward to the future or are you relieved to have got the first one out? How are you feeling now? Um, it's a strange time, obviously, for something to come out because it doesn't feel real because I can't actually go and see it out anywhere. But I think um, as I was doing it, I had to record the audio book a couple of weeks ago. And whilst I was going through it, I was like, oh gosh, because some of it, I don't know, I think probably much more for young people that every year feels very different of your life. When you look back, say you're 15, you look back when you're 13 and you're like, oh God, oh, yeah, I was so silly then. But I still feel that that most of this writing was done when I was 22 or 23, and now I'm 25, which isn't that much older in the grand scheme of things, but already my style, I think, has shifted. And some of the kind of breathlessness of my writing then, of kind of just being amazed by everything, 
I'd love to go back and tighten it and write. I think if I write again, I'd write in a slightly less naive way um, and try and be more judgmental or not in a, not in a sharp, unkind way, but just more aware of like my own position within the situation I'm writing in. So I really want to write again to kind of like keep improving. But does that kind of then sit as a bit of like a regret that you can't change that writing that you've done? Or do you have to sort of sit tight and look back on it, kind of glad that it happened and looking forward to being different with the next one? I think sitting tight, I think it's that thing. It's like when you read something like Catcher in the Rye, there's that sense of, I love a comic coming of age novel or piece of nonfiction. And I think I can kind of look back on it warmly and be like, I couldn't have written that a different way. And it'd be quite strange to then shift it as if it were written in an older voice. Like, I think it's almost important that that's how I was at that age. And it really did feel like that. It felt wonderful and every moment felt really dramatic. So I wouldn't change that. I just know that I'd like to write different. I would write differently now. I've, I've got a question from someone, well, actually two or three people have asked it who are listening today. How do you feel about pen versus computer? We've got a Ooh. lot of kids listening who probably <laughs> are like, writing notes to try and you know write a book or write poetry or whatever it is or write their first script and then obviously everyone's now learning virtually and stuck with their keyboard yeah How i think any work for you both as a teenager and then since in terms of your writing being tech versus practical i think in the way that um an artist would constantly try and shift mediums i still don't think i've worked out the perfect way to write and i think that often a blank screen is more intimidating than a blank page because there's something I feel like a blank page you can get things wrong more it feels quite nice to cross things out and it stays there so I think I feel less judgmental of my own writing on when I'm writing on a page and my thing I've started doing recently because I struggle with feeling distracted a lot I've gone back to a brick phone but I still have a computer so I don't think it's really worked with not being distracted but I put any technology away I often want to just put a timer on for like an hour and then I'll just say I've got this notebook in front of me and I'm just going to write for an hour and I think I write a lot more freely and maybe what I write is more interesting if a bit more scrappy than what I'd write on a computer and then the next day I type that up onto the computer and kind of refine it as I go so I think both are necessary but I actually do think I think you feel a bit more free when you write by hand and you can do little drawings on the side of things mm. I think it's quite a different experience I guess it's tough to take a laptop on a fishing trawler too yeah, I'd have not. I'd definitely have dropped over the side. I'm very clumsy. <laughs> I guess similar wanna... to the tech question too. What about books versus Kindle? Like, are you a are you a sort of old school book fan? You're a Kindle. Yeah, fan? old school book fan. Um, every single page has to be kind of like um, what do you call it? Dogged. I always like to. So then I go back to it and write notes about it later. I'm quite messy. I probably get food in my books as well, but I quite like them. I don't. I have actually never had a Kindle. I'm not sure. I'd like it. And I know that's like annoyingly like, oh, books, you know, you need to have the raw material book, but I do really like holding a book and taking it with me places. Yeah. You know what? Kindles are useful when your book takes 10 days to arrive during coronavirus. That's the only problem. True. <laughs> Maura, no, it's fine. Can I ask, um, a few people have asked, favorite book, favorite author, favorite play? Oh God, it changes your... all the time. I think everything I read kind of gets me excited in a different way. I think, I have two favorite books that were my favorite, or maybe three, whilst I was reading Dark, whilst I was writing Dark Soul Clear. So one of those, oh, I just saw it. I just saw it. Let's give it a walk. So I think, okay, so one of the books that remains my favorite for a long time and got me excited about writing is um, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse because I'd never read a modernist book before. And there's a part in the middle section where suddenly time just moves really, really differently and goes really fast. And I'd never seen anything like that. I didn't know you could play in books like that. And it also is based on the lighthouse, um, which is in the same bay as St. Ives, which is where my mum comes from in Cornwall. So I've always felt a kind of connection to Virginia Woolf. And then, yeah, my other favorite book that I love going back to that. I often look at when I'm mentoring as well. It's a book called Cannery Row by John Steinbeck, which is a really tiny book, but it captures people so beautifully. And he's got this incredible empathetic style. And then favorite play, I don't know. That's a really tough one. It's such a tough one. Do you have a favorite one? Mm, it's, it's what time they hit you, isn't it? It's what, what the theater's like when you're there. And I suppose it depends whether you read a lot of theater or not as well. But. 
No, it's, it's difficult. I'd find that an impossible question to answer. Yeah, I, re I read a brilliant one last week called The Writer by Ella Hickson, which is like deconstructing. There's like a character who is the writer in it and a character who is the director. And that felt so playful and again, unusual. So I think I really enjoyed that. I'm not sure it's my favorite, but I liked it a lot. So if there, if there are kids out there who, you know, I remember being a bit young, well, still now, actually, I still suffer from this. Some books you just immediately get into and others you kind of struggle through, through the first hundred pages and sometimes they don't survive and sometimes they do. What would be your big tip in terms of reading for kids now, you know, in your mentoring or just generally advice now in terms of picking the right content and how to kind of find things you enjoy that will inspire you? I think, I think reading is really difficult. I think in the same way that learning an instrument takes practice to actually sit with a book for a long time can feel really hard, particularly when we're distracted, particularly when something quite scary is happening in the whole world at the moment. I think it makes it really hard to concentrate. So I think letting yourself read really slowly and carefully. I'm quite obsessed with close reading. So I love, I think that's one of my favorite things about mentoring is doing that with a student, getting to pick apart just one page and that starting to come alive. And then once you've understood one page and really like that, I think then you can stick with a book a bit more and it makes it less intimidating because you're like, I think I've understood just that one part of it. That's and great. I think being unafraid of going back to like wonderful kids books, don't, don't think that you, I, I remember the first time I read an adult book, I had to read Rebecca when I was 11 and I cried because I was so upset that that's what adult books were because it seemed so much less imaginative and exciting than kids books. So I think that thing of like, don't push yourself if you're not enjoying it. Go back to the books you know you love and then try again later. Lamorna, can I ask, we've got, a, we've got a silly game coming up. So that's in about a couple of minutes. But I wanted to ask, um, you've obviously, you are a mentor, a very good one to lots of people, who, who, which is fantastic. And you've spoken a lot about your time at Oxford and the support you got there. Um, have you had a kind of formal mentor growing up professionally or personally? I was thinking about this. I don't think I did have, and I was talking to my friend about this yesterday. I don't think I had a mentor. I think I had wonderful teachers and I think I had friends who I learned a huge amount from. But I think it's something I think about a lot because there's a couple of students, there's one student I've been working with for a couple of years now um, who's a teenager and that relationship of someone in their 20s and in their teen years has taught me so much. So I think that because you start to forget what it's like to how you feel when you're younger. And I think I always want to hold on to that. And it feels like quite a powerful kind of relationship to have with someone who's not the same age as your teachers or your parents, who's that bit closer, who's still working things out, but maybe he's had a few more experiences than you. So I don't think I had one, but I, I wish going back now, I'd had someone in my twenties to support me. And I've got maybe one more big question, which I hope is a difficult one, but well, I hope it's not too difficult one, but what do you think really makes good writing? Oh, I'm going to sound like um, an average tutor. I'm so sorry, but I guess, well, I suppose there's so many different types of good writing, but I think the, there's like what, things that get me really excited about are, I think, I, I think I really care about the way that people think. So I think if I read something that articulates a feeling that I've never been able to express before, or a character who does something and then responds to it in a way that makes me go, oh my God, that's, that's what the kind of, that's what it's like to live. I think that's the stuff that really matters to me. So a writer who can both write a beautiful story and it be exciting and interesting, but then also can go that bit deeper and kind of interrogate what it's like to be a person. Yeah. That's a good answer. They're very easy then. <laughs> yeah. so easy I've done it uh, I no. feel like we could chat for hours yeah. um, unbelievably we've already taken 20 minutes of your time Lamorna um, and we're we're yeah we're very grateful so thank you thank and you I know that everyone here so nice. I'm sorry to everyone out there who's asked questions that I haven't been able to get to I've got to a, a few of them but not nearly even past half of them and if anyone has questions for you I'm sure they can get in touch with us afterwards or Definitely. find you on your Twitter or somewhere like that I don't know whether whether that that's probably best, but I hope uh, that this is not, I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be talking. And I'm really excited to get my teeth into your book once it fi finally arrives on my doorstep through, yeah. through Waterstones Online. Oh, thank you. And a big thank you from both of us. Can I just ask one thing from the sort of absolute sublime to the completely ridiculous, we have a game of biscuit face. And the idea is, is it, I hope everyone uh, has their biscuit ready. Um, <laughs> 
if, if not, quickly go to the kitchen and get one. I've got my di digestive here. The idea is, Lamorna, when you're uh, when you won the you know the the the, the Booker Prize, um, the idea is is for one person to say I beat Lamorna Ash in a game of biscuit face. So um, it's a very simple game you've played with after eights. Um, do you have a biscuit there? I've got a biscuit. I'm ready. Uh, we we prepped you. So I'm going to play officiator for today. <laughs> It's a, it's a simple game, a bit like Top Gear. We're going to um, score, we're going to mark down your score and it's going to go onto a leaderboard and that will be the biscuit base offered in leaderboard. Um, Ken will set us off. The idea is to get a biscuit or part of a biscuit from your forehead to your mouth without touching it. Uh, there's a timer of a minute. I hope if everyone- it falls off, you can put it back on. Yeah, totally fine. part of a biscuit. Am I going to be disadvantaged by having a whole biscuit? Uh, no, I think I've that one's enormous. I reckon you can have half of your biscuit. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, right. I imagine everyone across the country has got their digestives. I did do this in, as an offered in summer camp person, so hopefully. No, amazing. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, are we ready? Three, two, one, go. Uh, I forgot oh, yeah. that you had to go slow. Walter, you look like you're heading for the sea. Ah, oh, uh, no! No! <laughs> I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds. Okay. If anyone does it in under 40 Oh. Minutes. oh. How you doing, I also always wonder if there's a good biscuit for this. If anyone's not trying it, right. they definitely be trying it. Oh my God. 28. <laughs> and 30, we'll give you that, 32. Mm, just about got it in there, maybe. <laughs> 38 and 32. So you see, here we go. We've got a leaderboard. You're the first two people on the leaderboard. Wow! So nice. It's going to be like Top Gear by the end of next week. So we've got 32 seconds. And we've got, unbelievably, from Walter Carr, 28 seconds. Really good. That's why you had Edison. Lamorna, thank you so much for... Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. No, thank you. We're very grateful. Feel free to leave meeting. I will and, do. Uh, have a lovely, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye. And